Hi, I'm Suze Montgomery with the Extended Learning Academy at the Ventura Townhouse, and we're having our community education event today, and we are overwhelmed because this is Colonel John Woolley, and we're going to let him speak to you in just a moment. But John has, this is his third time here, third, yeah, time? third time, and today we're doing about Truman and the dropping of the bomb in Hiroshima. So we, uh, John runs the... I'm the... Uh executive officer and the museum director for the commemorative air force that's located out at the Camarillo airport. And what, it's open to the public, correct? Open to the public, we're only closed on Mondays, uh, 10 to four, and we have 11 World War II vintage uh, aircraft, and uh, uh, we have a nice little museum there, and we certainly welcome everyone in the community to come out to see our wonderful collection of uh, of our artifacts and our uh, aircraft. It's very impressive. I just recently attended there again, but this time I attended a memorial for one of my students that passed away who was a World War II flying ace. No, Bob and Bob McCampbell. Yeah who's been on our show, and Bob was an amazing man. But I did not know that they even had, this was like an event. It was a celebration of his life. It wasn't really, right. yeah, it, it, was a memorial. Wasn't a, it wasn't sad. It wasn't, uh, d you know, despondency or anything like that. It was, it was just a wonderful celebration of his life. And the amazing thing is, John, when I saw this happening, I remember we, the kids, his children were on stage singing uh, songs that they used to sing with their dad. But after they finished that, the doors opened from either side on right. the hangar doors, and we could see the tarmac with old war birds out there. Yeah. And they, it was amazing. I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Oh, no. It's, we have a wonderful collection of P-51 Mustang, F-6, F Hellcat, and there's only four flying Japanese zeros in the world, and two of them are at uh, our hangar. One is owned by Paul Allen, you know, of Microsoft fame, and uh, one is ours. So it's a wonderful collection of, uh, of uh, history and memorabilia that uh, uh, we just don't find uh, uh, very often. And the people who come like Susan, they say, God, this is a jewel. It is a jewel. We, we didn't know it was there. So uh, hopefully, Bob, with your uh, KDY and that, uh, we can, uh, uh, you know, have this legacy of this history that's uh, long past, but we want to still keep it alive, especially the sacrifices of our parents and our family, uh, uh, because that was a time that I wish our country could think back to when we were all on the same page, we're all for a common good, and uh, it's, uh, it's nice to re revisit that. Boy, but he couldn't have said it better than I. I mean, this is exactly why I think we need to pay attention to pieces of history, such as at the museum, that you don't see anywhere else. And it does not divide this country. Everybody loves veterans, and mostly us. We're losing them, guys, so get out there. Visit John's museum. Visit the Air Force, you know, commemorative Air Force. It's a piece of living history. And as part of the commemorative Air Force, uh, our purpose is to share this with the community. And uh, anyone who would like to uh, have uh, myself or a group of us come and make a presentation to share that, to uh, lead tours, uh, I, we just, that's our purpose. So uh, don't hesitate to give us a call. And also, the Extended Learning Academy here at the Ventura Townhouse, I teach classes, and they're free to the public, open Tuesday through Friday at 1 o'clock. So come and join us. We have a great class. Uh, we do something a little different every day, and the students drive the content. I, I just facilitate, so it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. So we're going to start our program any second here, and again, thank you for coming and bringing Harry Truman alive to us <laughs> to again today. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you all again to the continuing education portion of the Extended Learning Academy, which is the classes that we have here. My name is Suze Montgomery. I'm the uh, Executive Director of the Extended Learning Academy. My students are in the audience, thanks to my students for always supporting me <coughs> and our organization. And today we have our third round. We're so lucky that Colonel John Woolley is back with us again today to give us another piece of living history. In this case, he's talking. Uh, his topic today is about Truman and dropping the bomb. This is a great subject. I mean, last time I think you were here, we had Battle of Britain. Battle of Britain, yeah. I'm trying to remember it was the Battle of Britain. I think because they're so good. But I'd like to introduce, and I'm just going to sit down and watch along with you, Colonel John Woolley and his capable partner in crime, Sharon Dwyer. Cato. Cato, otherwise known as Cato for you people of a certain age. We all know who that is. 
So take it away, kids. Yeah, well, I'm a, we're all a, the commemorative Air Force originally started uh, as the uh, Confederate Air Force down in uh, Texas in, in the mid 50s. So it's like uh, uh, er everyone's a colonel in the, uh, in the Confederate uh, and now the commemorative Air Force. So uh, uh, people say, well, what did, did, did you fly? No, I was in the Army. I, I was in the Army and Intelligence Agency. But uh, I think it's what brings this is our families. Uh, my father, my five uncles, uh, my mother worked in the factory. You know, it's a part of our history that's still a permanent part of our history. And I look at the audience here, and Jim Hinckley was a, a colonel in the uh, United States Army, uh, Saitan Okinawa. Uh, you know, this is part of our history that is that has left a lot of uh, uh, an absence, an absence, if you will. And there's still many topics that are uh, worthy that help us give an insight into not only what happened, but what, what we do, do today is based upon our past actions. And uh, uh, as I said before, I was talking to Bob uh, Allen, and it's really, uh, you know, this is a, a time in our history when we were all together. We all pulled together. I wish we could get that magic again where uh, uh, we're not polarized, uh, but that's, many people could say that that's our finest hour. You know, it's just, you know, it's our country. Uh, the topic here was one based upon its, uh, now there's some controversy. And so I think it's, uh, to look back in history at this time, uh, uh, the controversy, the decision to drop the bomb, at that time, uh, the public opinion polls that have, that the, in favor of dropping the bomb was 87%. In 1995, it was a little over 50%. And history changes and unfolds, and uh, people take different views on it. So when people have asked me, uh, my background in history, et cetera, uh, experience just like you li living through this time of, uh, well, what led to that decision? Why, why did we drop these, uh, these uh, the atom bomb? Uh, what was it really necessary? At one time in our country's history, we thought it was very important that sort of been uh, diminished. And a few uh, few years ago, there was a big uproar at the Sm uh, Smithsonian incident when they uh, uh, inaugurated the Enola Gay. They, uh, the presentation was more about the horrifics of, uh, of the atom bomb on these two cities rather than on those things that led up to making this decision. And uh, uh, it was a great decision. Uh, but we'll unfold a story here, and it's what I like. This is sort of a a conversation, and my thing uh, I thought would be give a little bit of background about the war in the Pacific, uh, the Japanese, how they felt about things, and then uh, uh, the unfolding of the Pacific War that culminated in the end with, uh, with the dropping of these two bombs on uh, August 6th and August 9th, and the capitulation, the swing for peace by the Japanese on August 15th. So. Uh, it's a big topic, and, uh, and we're going to, Cato here is going to try and keep me going because each of these incidents of themselves are pretty important. And so let's, let's start going here. There's the famous photo. This is from the National, I pulled this down from the National Archives of uh, a 60,000 foot plume of uh, uh, Nagasaki on uh, April, the, excuse me, on August 9th. Forward and back uh, with Japan, the background. Uh, uh, we didn't know much about Japan. Japan just came into modernization uh, at the end of the 19th century and uh, won this war with Russia in 1904. We were intimately involved in that because uh, I think the uh, Peace Prize went to uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt for negotiating that peace. But there's little known about that, that the implication was the United States was uh, supporting Japan in their efforts in the, in the Pacific. Uh, and so it was more or less, we have our Truman Doctrine and Monroe Doctrine about our sphere of influence in, uh, in Central and South America. Uh, the implication that we were supporting the Japanese in their uh, expansion, and the Japanese were saying, well, the Germans, the English, the Dutch, everyone is profiting in this imperialism. Uh, why can't we? In fact, we have a bigger right to it than that. They formed something called the 
people that later did uh, Southeast Asia co-prosperity spirits. Uh, so uh, leading up to that, the Japanese were very close society. Uh, they had a, at least a, a, a framework of what seemed like the democratic, uh, uh, they had their, uh, uh, they had their parliament, they had their, their, their leaders, etc. And uh, uh, Pratics, uh, with the uh, emperor at the, uh, as, as the head, uh, gradually became taken over by, by the military and were uh, pretty close to society. And uh, the fear of, uh, and the expansion rose to such a level that we finally found that uh, the Japanese, uh, they invaded uh, Manchuria by a uh, small group of army people. Then in 1937, uh, the invasion of, uh, of uh, China and the culmination, the decision that uh, uh, they wanted to build their military, but they have a, a country the size of California, but, the, but they had very few raw materials. So then where are we going to get to support this? And so they originally were looking at Siberia, uh, Manchuria, uh, et cetera. Uh, but the wealth of the Southeast Asia and uh, of the Dutch East Indies, et cetera, uh, prove that uh, their, their imperialistic uh, instincts uh, drove to that, and it ended in what they felt was their, uh, was their uh, goal to uh, have a hegemony over this area, and they will have their raw resources, etc. cetera. Uh, the one thing standing with, of course, was the, uh, the United States was against this, the British were against this, uh, but they were coming, our country was coming out, out of the depression, etc. And so we imposed some embargoes, etc. But the Japanese uh, really looked at the point of view that uh, uh, if we're going to do this, uh, America is a point of weakness. Uh, uh, the Germans are uh, look like conquering uh, Russia. Uh, we will be uncontested in that area. So. Uh, so right here we show what the expansion was. The Chinese, uh, the Japanese, from here spread out all the way over up into the uh, Aleutian Islands. Their idea was that, that uh, when Pearl Harbor, uh, that would uh, 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 bring the Pacific Fleet uh, to an end. The United States put the Pacific Fleet, and that they would be free to reign. And this area here. So within six months, they conquered a great deal of uh, of the Pacific area, and thinking that the United that they created this, uh, they created from up here all the way around to here, a ring a barrier against that uh, the United States would be uh, 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 would, would not contest too heavily, and they would seek a negotiated peace. And so that sort of prompted this idea that the Japanese uh, uh, would have a, be able to uh, force the United States by their uh, claiming this and being not feeling that the United States was uh, uh, was uh, could muster its forces, if you will, to uh, confront the Japanese. And so with the invasion, with the uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, etc. They did neutralize some of the fleet, uh, but uh, we gradually marshaled our forces. And uh, the one person who was really against it, uh, the Japanese, was a uh, invasion was a guy named Hizuruku Yamamoto, who led the uh, actual planning for Pearl Harbor. He was in the United States for six years uh, on naval attaché duties, and he knew that the that the breadth of the industrialization of the United States was much superior than the Japanese. And he thought that if you couldn't gain this in about six months in negotiated peace, that uh, it was going to be a long war, and it wasn't favoring the uh, of, of the Japanese. Okay. The 
The thing about uh, what we were going to do at uh, Casablanca in 1943, I think it was January 1943, when uh, Churchill uh, met with uh, uh, Roosevelt and Chiang Kai-shek, and they had already de decided that the uh, war in Europe was the primary, that the big biggest fear was the, uh, from Hitler and uh, the occupation of, uh, of Europe, uh, that the United States would just uh, end up having a defensive battle in the Pacific until the war in the Europe was, uh, was re resolved. So at that time, uh, uh, Roosevelt come up with a statement said, well, nothing but the unconditional uh, surrender of Germany or Japan would suffice. And some people thought, well, that sort of didn't leave many options open for Germany or Japan. But we were looking at fascism and a very brutal military government. And Churchill and Roosevelt felt that the only way that could be stamped out was to uh, occupy those countries and make sure that those regimes or that type of regime does not em emanate. Because you recall the Treaty of Versailles, uh, Germany wasn't occupied. Germany just surrendered. And the French and the English were very upset about that, and the Germans were too. The Germans saying, we didn't, we didn't lose it on the battlefield, we lost it to politics. And then Hitler come up with those communists and those Jews. They're the ones that cost us, you know, and that, that, uh, that. So, uh, Casablanca then, with this term, uh, we're only going to accept an unconditional surrender, uh, forced that uh, the Japanese were still saying, well, we can hold off the attrition that will be so bloody that the United States will, uh, and British, etc., will be involved in a negotiated peace, and we will preserve part of our uh, part of our our government. And so, as we got involved in the war, uh, one of the generals under uh, MacArthur's staff was saying, trying to understand the Japanese was like trying to understand the dark side of the moon because we had no experience, really. With, with that. Uh, so the war casually, let me mention that uh, Sharon and I were up at the Boeing Flight, uh, Flight Museum up in Seattle, and we were coming across that, uh, that stand, and here's listing the deaths of uh, attributed to World War II, almost 60 million. Can you imagine that figure? When I go to high school class and I talk about this, put some zeros behind that. It was horrific, and uh, uh, that helped shape the decisions. And as we were facing it on our early, uh, now here's a shot of uh, Guadalcanal. Uh, that was our first experience with the in real warfare because it's what we were doing up to that time. We were supplying uh, the British, we were supplying the Russians. Uh, uh, we were supplying the, uh, the Chinese, but this was our first real act of uh, being involved in, in the war. Okay, here's a very famous, uh, I believe it was November 1943, we're in the Gilbert Islands, I guess this, this is Tarawa. And as, we, as these events, there's Tarawa again, this is a graphic example of uh, the horror of war that uh, and the enemy we were fighting. These events now, go to the next one, okay? Here's Bougainville. Okay. Uh, this is Pe Peleliu. Uh, yeah. So a bunch of stuff on, on these. As you know, uh, the losses, and it's what is sort of hard for us to comprehend. In the Western world, we would fight to live that it seemed like we were fighting an enemy that fought to die. And that is, well, it's counter, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive to how we deal with it. why that statement about understanding the Japanese was like understanding the dark side of the moon. That it was very, very difficult. So you have these, uh, like Tarot, there are 2,917 uh, Japanese on uh, that small atoll there. 
and uh, there were only nine survivors. So we're looking at a loss rate, and this keeps going up in uh, at Bougainville, at uh, uh, Roy and Amari and the uh, Marshalls, and you're getting where the casualty rates are over 98% up in at two uh, in, in the Aleutians when they finally, uh, they just left them there. They, it was going to be too costly to remove them. So the Japanese, rather than surrendering, fought to the death. There were only, I think, three survivors. So you have a 99% so Here's what we became aware of. We're fighting people that are fighting absolutely to the death. And we start our casualty race then from, uh, I think it was from uh, January, uh, from. Uh, yeah, from January 42 to uh, uh, 43, there were 62,000 American fatalities from January 1 in 1943 to July of 43, uh, 44. There were, uh, uh, excuse me, there were 69,000 fatalities. So in six months, we started to get our operations in Saipan, etc. Uh, the, uh, the loss rates were going up to where it was. Uh, that the casualty rates during this time were 70, 80,000 uh, casualties a month up and through uh, the spring of 1945. We thought that the war would be over. Remember, I'll be home by Christmas, that type of thing. Well, we would thought that uh, under normal circumstances, fighting a military battle, when you lost the military ability to defend yourself, you surrendered. Well, the Germans did not surrender, and the Japanese did not surrender. We thought the war would be over, so we start discharging our people, our our soldiers. If you had enough points from a crew, from time in a war zone, or you were a combat pilot, you flew your 25 missions or your 50 missions, we started discharging, and we started realizing that we now had to up the draft by 100,000 starting in January of 1945 to replace those that were uh, had uh, that, that were being discharged, but for the realization that the Japanese were not going to uh, just surrender as in a normal after the battle of uh, Second Battle of Philippine Sea, the Battle of Lake Tegel, their whole naval they were incapacitated. They lost their air crews in Saipan. So they were providing no actual defense to the preservation of their, all based on the premise that they were going to hold out and make it so bloody that we would sue, uh, the Allies would sue for a, uh, for a, uh, a, a negotiated uh, peace. Here's Iwo Jima, my uncle, uh, Joe was on Iwo Jima, had a minor wound, but he never recovered. He recovered from the physical wound, but he never recovered from the mental anguish that he fought as a, a Green Raider with the 5th Green Ra Raider Division on Iwo Jima. He would wake up at night, full sweats, he would scream. I remember, and it's, uh, so it just wasn't the fatalities. The mutilation of the mind and the body was, uh, was, and the people kept saying, "Well, the United States are going to get tired of this," and uh, we would have them. So the closer we got to Japan, the more intense these operations began. Uh, and so when we lived in Iwo Jima, the next was uh, Okinawa. Now, Jim, what, what, what was your, your role in Okinawa? I was in the 27th. Okay, and what? what what, what were you doing? He was scheduled to go and invade in March. Uh -huh. We had we had first we were in the northern end of the island. Uh -huh. There were still thousands of yeah. people there in the And what was you being on the ground there, Jim? Uh, could you share with us uh, the ferocity of the fighting, or what? To describe that to some of us that were were not involved in that. Well, one of the problems on Okinawa was the training center for the field artillery, like. Fort Sill and all the places they had been here, the trains, and, and they had constructed it in such a way that they had big, great big armor plates in front of the openings. They only fought at night because during the day we could see the open gun, but at night they closed them up quick. So they would fire an artillery shell 
down into where we were, which was bizarre and higher, and uh, kept most of us awake most of the night. And a tired army doesn't do very much during the day. And all of a sudden, they discovered that there's there, there places up there where we couldn't use tanks. And we should have known about it, but we didn't know about it. So it was every day, day in and day out, to get more people. Get See, and I talk about it from reading. I was, during this time, I was seven, eight years old. You know, Jim was fighting it, you know, so I just know this this from reading and from movies and from talking to my uncles and my dad. But Jim lived it, you know. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Japanese were considered not the best troops, but the most ferocious. The, supposedly the best soldiers were the Germans, but the Japanese were the most ferocious of this. Uh, Jim, what your experience did you see? Well, they were invincible. When they pulled off Pearl Harbor, they believed they were invincible. But then when the Beatle Raid came shortly after that, yeah. then some people on the way began to realize maybe they weren't that invincible. So they brought back some of the zeros, yeah. they brought back some of the military or the army yeah. units, and they brought back a whole lot of airplanes yeah. called the Home Defense Force. Yeah. And, and, and it was supposedly a million people that we weren't quite sure about what was the capability of them, but they bombed just their factories. Sure. In Japan, you bomb one night, arrest them, and the next morning it's back serving breakfast. And I think this is the most, whatever a good word for aggressive people, the bomb. right back in the war the next day. Yeah, yeah, it was just a, a will that is, is tough for us. That's why I keep referring back. It's understanding the Japanese mind from our perspective is like understanding the dark side of the moon. And I think we're going to, as we grow went into this then, uh, the normal way of conducting war from us, you know, was we destroy their navy, uh, we destroy their air force, so we destroy their means of production. But as Jim is indicating here, some pretty startling things happen. Uh, a little known facts uh, uh, that many that uh, radio intelligence did a great part in us winning the war. And the ultra and the magic uh, uh, ability uh, to break and monitor the codes. A lot of this information didn't come out until 1995 because it was classified. And you know, some of us we wonder why did they classify information? It should be public information. Well, in studying the records, one of the reasons it was classified because we were not only monitoring the Japanese, we were monitoring our some of our allies too. And so we had every day a summary of what the magic and ultra communications correspondence was on the desk of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So what we thought was probably happening in Japan, especially in the spring of 1945, was uh, we thought that they were pretty isolated. And, and uh, But as Jim has indicated here, in, uh, in April, they thought there were, uh, let's go, there's Iwo Jima, there's Carnage there. That is, uh, that is Okinawa that, that Jim was referring to. Uh, the kamikaze, <laughs> they destroyed more American shipping off of Okinawa in two months than they had in the previous, up to that time, the war. And there's another element that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that type of, uh, that, that will, that it's just, uh, it's, it's almost incomprehensible for us to, to, under, to understand. And so from the Air Force, when uh, Saipan, uh, when we gained uh, uh, in June and July of 1944, uh, occupied Saipan, Guam, Tinian, uh, these bases were then uh, Air Force bases. We had tried to have our bases in, in China, but China proved to be not a very reliable ally. And so the 20th uh, uh, bombing force that was in China uh, and the news of the 20th Bombing Command, there was the 20, 20th and the 21st Air Force. Uh, person Curtis LeMay 
Douglas LeMay. Uh, he was appointed commander of the uh, 21st Bomber Command. We'll get into this. So the other element, we would just bomb and destroy the productive capabilities of Japan. Right here, that's fine. No, that's fine, Chairman. This is Tokyo. The shot you're seeing is a couple days after firebomb raids on March the 9th and March the 10th, 1945. Uh, uh, our strategic bombing concept was that we would go in at 30,000 feet or so, and with our, uh, with our, our bomb devices, uh, we'd be able to uh, in, uh, accurately destroy the production capacity of the Japanese as we had sort of done in, in Europe. Well, the Air Force found out quickly it was a little bit different. When you're flying at 30,000 feet, suddenly we become aware of it. We weren't aware of something called the jet stream, about 130 miles an hour. So uh, the results were very minimal uh, on the initial bombing raids. And in fact, they changed command. Half Arnold uh, uh, replaces one person named uh, General uh, uh, Hansel uh, by Kurt Curtis LeMay, who was come over from the 8th Air Force. Uh, who was a very, very practical commander. And so he came up with this idea that the way these other, uh, for since November up into March, were unsuccessful, their bombing results, that we're going to try a different tactic. So they just stripped all the, uh, the guns and the armament off the B-29s and said we're going to fly at night. We're going to fly uh, at uh, five, seven, and nine thousand feet, and we're going to hit DC. Ninety-eight percent of the cities in Japan were wood or paper, and also the targets. The targets. It was hard to distinguish between a civilian uh, uh, housing and the industrial part because they had a lot of their their support for the major factories where the final construction for air, airplane frames and that were done in the, in the homes, drill presses and that. So uh, the night of March the 9th, about, just about midnight, these 200 and some B-29s flying 1,500 miles from uh, uh, Saipan and Tinian went in at the low level, and at that night they were having winds of 40 to 80 miles an hour. So these, these planes, the previous, can, can you go back one? Yeah. Uh, the American uh, tech, were great developers. During 19, uh, I think it was 1941, went to the chemical, the Dow chemical people and the leaders of the MIT, how can we make a more effective bomb? So they designed this bomb, it's called the M69. M69 is an incendiary bomb. And from that, the development napalm. So they had these, these canisters flying out 62 pounds inside of these napalm. And once they would stroke, strike a certain area, they would, that napalm spread out. So can you imagine? Uh, 60, 70 mile an hour winds, uh, paper and uh, wood construction. Uh, that on, okay, the next one, Destroyed 15.8 square miles. Now think of that. 15.8 square miles. That devastated, there were 35 wards in, in uh, Tokyo. It basically destroyed five wards. And the, the, the uh, towards the uh, down, it's a pushing, that's stupid. But it, it would, uh, uh, the concentration up here, can you imagine in a square mile you have 130,000 people in it? Upwards to this one area where the concentration was 165,000 people per square mile. Over a million homes were gone. They had already started to migrate. As, as Jim indicated, there was a warning coming out that, well, maybe we are going to be attacked and we're going to be bombed more frequently. So they started evacuating the cities. In fact, they started even cutting, you can see, uh, uh, 
broad stripes along in here. They started these uh, cutting into the cities, big strips of land for fire breaks because they knew what was coming. So by the end of uh, the summer into June, 60 percent of the Japanese 60 cities, 67 percent were obliterated by these attacks. Woolies fell backwards is yellow. 